I cannot wait for next weekend. It is going to be such an incredible weekend. And so three services, Saturday night at 5, and then our two regular Sunday services. It's going to be an incredible day. Bring your friends. It's going to be amazing. In this month of December, we've been talking about trying to have a simple Christmas this year. And so we're going to wrap up this series today, really just looking at Christmas gift giving. Isn't that sound wonderful? Christmas gift giving. And, uh, and what we're going to do with it, though, is we're going to talk about how, how living generously uh, benefits our lives as much as it does to those that we give those gifts to. So we're going to be looking at a story in Matthew chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, you're going to open that up. That's the kind of the base of where we're hanging out is in Matthew chapter 2 today. And uh, I just wanted to share with you, like in our culture, the Christmas story has been uh, tidied up a bit, right? Like it's, it's been cleaned up uh, because the true story is so shocking and surreal. Uh, we have this newborn king, right? That is born in this, this overcrowded stable uh, with all of this manure and these smells. And, and, and then it's intensified when we recognize that it's God that's in the middle of all this, right? God is born as this little baby. And if that is not shocking enough as it is, the conditions in which he were born in are absolutely shocking, and so this story has been cleaned up quite a bit. And, and the Magi, which we'll see here in this story in Matthew chapter 2, the Magi are also a part of all of this tidying up and cleaning things up in this story as well. When we look, when we look at the Magi, the, the wise men, Magi in the original Greek is the word magos. Magos means magician or sorcerer. The Magi were astrologers. Like they looked to the sky and they made predictions. And, and, and so, like, what is so shocking about this story is that God doesn't like astrology. Uh, all throughout the Bible, he talks about how uh, he despises astrology. He says, don't, don't practice astrology. Don't get involved in an occult. Don't play with the spirit world. You're playing with fire there. Don't do it. And so what is so shocking in this, then, is that it's the Magi... In this story that God calls across the desert to come find the Christ child. And what I want you to see this morning, like right up top and what we're doing and what we're talking about today is this is how much God loves you and that he loves every single one of us. That any time, every time that there is someone, could be you, could be somebody that you know, who is far away from God. They're, they're not connected to him at all. And it seems like they're not going to be. God will do everything he possibly can to reveal himself. And that's exactly what we see with these magi and how, the, how far away they were, yet he, here is God revealing himself, using an astrological sign to do it. It blows my mind. Love is written all throughout the Christmas story. In every little nook and cranny that you try to uncover, you will find the love of God reaching out to those that do not know him. So here in this story, these prominent magi, these wise men from Babylon, uh, they begin to pack up their things, right? They start stuffing into their Gucci bags <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they jump onto their Camelax, right? And they go 800 miles across to find, to find the Christ child. And finally, when they get there, uh, this is what we read, what happens beginning in verse 11 of Matthew chapter two. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother and they bowed down and worshiped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These wise men were the original givers of the Christmas gift, right? Like, this is where we get our tradition of gift giving. And so today what we want to do is we're going to share with you some benefits of living generously, of being a giver. In, in your notes there, you'll see it, like how giving benefits my own life. If you're taking notes Here's the first one that we're going to look at. Giving blesses me in return. It does. Uh, 
This can't be the main reason why we are generous, but it is a reality of life. Whenever uh, my generosity, whenever I give, it always comes back to bless me. And you see this all the time. It's Christmas, right? As we're handing out gifts to one another, you can see it. My oldest daughter, uh, Jessica, she is such a huge gift giver. She just does it all year long. But man, Christmas time is like, is like her peak season, man. She is loving every minute of it. And she is just handing out these gifts left and right. And, and what is so fun is to watch her as she is watching the joy on other people's faces as they're opening up these gifts. And she is getting all excited and giddy. I think that she is enjoying it more than the person that got the gift is enjoying it. It's incredible how giving will bless us in return. Psalm 112, <clears throat> beginning in verse 5. It says this, it says, Good will come to him who is generous. A righteous man will be remembered forever. Here's a question. What do you want to be remembered for? I love this quote from Calvin Coolidge. He says, No man is ever honored for what he received in life. He is only honored for what he gave. Isn't that a great quote? And then this other guy, I don't know if you know him, this guy I know, James Ranger, he says, you make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. That's so good. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. Uh, will you guys read this one out loud with me? Will you do that? Proverbs, here we go. Ready? Start. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshed others will himself be refreshed. That's why the happiest people on earth are always the gift givers. Like Jesus himself told us that, right? He says, he says there is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. Happy people are giving people. Happy people are generous people. They're happy from the joy that they receive in giving these gifts to others, but they're also happy because they're prospering. They see that the others are prospering by the gift that they have given, and in that it refreshes them and it makes them happy. And then, and then on the other hand, <laughs> there's the person who is stingy, who is a miser, who is so tight with their money that they squeak when they walk, right? <laughs> like, you know who I'm talking about. You've probably been around some of them in your life. And so kind of for example, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was this American business tycoon. I mean, film director, producer, uh, aviator, engineer, net worth of 11 billion at the time of his death. And this extremely wealthy man who supposedly had it all lived this very depressed and very unhappy existence. The day of his funeral, 14 people showed up. This was his life. And with all the possessions, he died. Sad, lonely, miserable man. Do you know where the word miserable comes from? It, it, it's actually, it actually is broke down from miser able. Like that's, that's where it comes from. And so the more that I hold on to my things, the more miser able I become. But the more generous that I am, the more happy that I am in my life. Because there are really two types of people. There are the givers and there are the takers. And the happiest people in this world are the givers. And God always blesses them in return. So that's the first benefit of living generously. Is, and here's the second benefit if you're taking note. Giving draws me closer to God. And, and I'm sure that you've noticed this, right? Like... That you, you want to give gifts to those, right, that uh, you love, that you're dear. And you find out as you give those gifts that it draws you closer together. I remember growing up, I wasn't much of a gift giver at all. Like, I wasn't into it at all. I was a taker. And so I, I just didn't get it. And then it, it all changed when I met my future wife, Kathleen. And then we spent like this first Christmas together. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I want to buy her all the things. I want to get her everything, but I don't have any money. And so, but I was like, she has to have all the gifts. So I went to the Valley Plaza and I went to like every single department store that they had. And I just, I opened up credit. And so there, I just started, buying. I'm like, oh, she'll like this and she'll like that. And oh, those are nice too. And, which by the way, I do not re recommend doing that at, at all. Like that, that set me back. 
a bit. <laughs> that was a little difficult to come from. But I just, I loved her, and I just wanted to express that in giving her all of these gifts. And she knew my heart and what I was trying and attempting to do there. And what happened is it actually drew us closer. Folks, please track with me here on what I'm, where I'm going with this, because when we give to God, when we give to him our time, when we give to him our praise, when we give to him our money, when we give to him our worship, every single step of that, we draw closer to him. Do you see that? That's what happens as we give. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21. He says, well, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. On Christmas Day, that's what's happening. Your heart is going to be full of love for those that you are giving your gift because your treasure, there your heart is as well. And so a question that I have then for everybody is like, where has your heart been? Like this entire year, if you look back throughout this past year, like where has your heart been? Because if, if your treasure, if your treasure of your time, the treasure of your money, the treasure of your energy, the treasure of your passion, if it is, if it is invested in your house or your RV or your business or your clothes or your career or travel or your social media status, like, then that's where your heart is. And like all of, there's nothing wrong with any of these things in and of themselves as long as we are prioritizing God first in all of it. You see, God wants to be number one in our hearts and that's what he's longing for for each of us. So whenever I am generous with God and the treasures that I have, I draw closer to him. Here's another benefit of gift giving, being generous. And that is giving is a victory over materialism. It happens with us. And isn't that great? Because we all need victory over materialism, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? Like, our society is such a materialistic society. And generosity is the antidote. We can overcome materialism by being generous. Like, every time it happens, every time that I am generous, I am breaking the spirit of materialism that says, I've got to have more. It's generosity that breaks it. Look at, look at 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world. And hold on, I just want to stop right here for a second because we have to understand this first line that we're reading. It's talking about you. The, by the rest of the world's standards, this is, we are the rich people in this present world. Like, like if we were to break it down and be like, do you own a car? Like, if you own a car, then you're in the top 9% of the world. Like, that's who you are. You are one of the richest people. There are so many people, the majority of the people in the world wish that they had just a little bit of what all of us have. And so I have to remember that. So I put myself here when I'm reading this, command those who are rich in this present world. Okay, so Paul's talking about me here. Not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I heard this great story about an eight-year-old boy who was really finding victory over materialism. There was a contest at the, at the local McDonald's, and, uh, and the big prize was a brand-new bicycle, and he won. He won the bicycle. He, he went home, and he told his parents, he said, I, I already have a bike. Like, I don't need two bikes. And so what happens then is he tells him, he's like, you know what, I, I have a friend who doesn't have a bike. And what I'd like to, he's never had a bike. I'd like to give him the bike. His parents aren't even able to get him one. I would like to, and so the parents said, sure, let's do that. You, let's give it to him. And so then word gets back to McDonald's and the manager there is just, just floored by this eight-year-old's generosity. And, and so what happens is she invites this boy, Ben, and this family over to dinner and then gives him a $100 gift card. 
And I'm not talking about $100 to McDonald's, right? Like here, this will last you forever on the dollar menu. It's just a hundred bucks. <laughs> and so, uh, so then the next day, the next day, he takes some of that money and he goes and buys a crash helmet for his friend <laughs> who had never been on a bike before. See, this is what happened. Giving, giving is a victory over materialism. Now, for the rest of the story, are you guys ready for Pastor Lydia Ranger? I am. Well, good morning. How are y'all doing? Jojo, I may have to borrow your iPad because I have no idea what I did with mine. <laughs> y'all, y'all love that, don't y'all? Oh, you found it. He found it. What would I do without Robert? Thank you, Robert. Okay, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have already got all your Christmas shopping done? I hate you. How many of you have not got your Christmas shopping done? I will see y'all on Christmas Eve at the mall as we are buying Chia Pets. Yeah, because that's all that's left. Yeah, or we'll end up at Walgreens, right? Yeah, we'll all be in trouble, not knowing what in the world to do. All right. Well, let's continue on after I can get this iPad open. There we go. All right. I can just sing, yeah, I'll just sing. All right, the next one. Giving strengthens my faith. Giving strengthens my faith. Now, nothing challenges us like giving away our money, right? Nothing challenges us. Nothing will build our faith like giving away our money. It challenges us. In fact, God says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and then he will fill your barns to overflowing. Now, this isn't a tithe message. All of y'all take a deep breath, okay? So it's okay. I'm just going to hit on this for a minute because we want to talk about all the areas that we give in our life in this sermon. And so this is one of them. It's with our money that we give. Now, God says to give him the, the first part, and then he'll take care of the rest, right? He's going to fill your barns full. That's what he says. But we want to say, wait a minute, God, you give to me and then I'll give to you. You say, oh, no, I'm not. Okay, I want to ask another question. How many of you have ever bought a lottery ticket and prayed over that sucker, right? <laughs> God, if you only let me win the lottery, I promise I will give you 10%, right? We all done that, yeah. In other words, you're wanting God to give to you and then you're going to give it back. No, but God says, give me the first 10%. Why? Because our money so many times represents where our heart's at. And so that's what he's saying. Now, I can tell you, out of years of being a tither, it's so much easier to give God what's left over than to give him that first part, right? Yeah, because you know how far this money has to go. But can I tell you, by repeatedly in our life giving God the first part, God has took care of so many needs in our life. It's unbelievable of what God has done. In fact, I remember right after we came to New Life, it was about a year later, and we bought our very first brand-new car. We had never brought a brand-new car. But we did not pray about it. We just decided we wanted to buy a brand new car. And I remember when we drove that park that car off of the parking lot or the lot car lot, I'm like, Oh dear Lord, we have done the wrong thing. I knew it. Just everything in me knew it. And I'm like, Oh, what have we done? Now I know what Ford stands for, fix or repair daily. I'm telling you that Ford Taurus was the car from hell. Everything you can think of went wrong. It was a good-looking car, but oh my gosh, it was the devil incarnate in a car. I'm telling you, it, we, we took it back. I can't even tell you how many times. Finally, at 60,100 miles, the transmission completely goes out on it. We have to have a whole new transmission put in it. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have we done with this stupid car? So finally, we pay this sucker off. And we decide we're going to turn this curse into a blessing. We're going to give this car away. We went, had somebody go through it, put a brand new transmission in it. We put all this money in it, make sure it was running good, and we're going to turn this curse into a blessing. Now, this is a nice car, and it's only four years old, so it's a good car. And we give it to Dell and Angie Claiborne. And I am not lying as sure as I am standing here. Three months later, that sucker caught on fire in the church parking lot and burned to the ground. It was a burnt offering. It was exactly what it should have been to begin with. Oh, my gosh. But I'm telling you. But can I tell you what happened? When we gave that car away, it wasn't but just a couple of weeks later, I got a call from a really good friend of ours who's with Jesus now, Bill Wright, who owned Bill Wright Toyota. 
And he called me and he said, hey, Lydia, come over to my office. I want to see you. And he was just that kind of man. He would just call you up and say, hey, come, I want to talk to you for a minute. And so I went over to his office. I didn't know what he wanted. And he said, hey, I want you to go out there on the lot and I want you to pick out a Camry. I'm going to give it to you free of charge to drive. And that man provided me a car for five years and let me drive that car free of charge. That's what God does by simply giving a car away. Poor old Dale and Angie, I wish that would have happened better for them. But... But you know what? God repays you. It's incredible when you give God a little. The Bible says, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will he pour back into your life. And the beauty of that is, is it's just not money. It's in every way of your life. He will pour back into your life. In just a little bit, we're going to be receiving our tithe and our legacy offering. And this is all about pouring back in, giving God something to work with, because I believe there's some of you that are sitting here, and you need a miracle in your life in this new year, whether it be financial, whether it be relational, whatever it is going to be, but some of you need a financial miracle, and I believe by you sowing the seed, God is going to do some incredible things in your life in this new year. No, this ain't a name it, claim it. I don't believe in that stuff, but I do believe there's a principle. It's not my principle. It's God's. God put it in there. He says, it's the only place in the Bible that God says, test me. Only place. And he says, test me and see if I won't come through for you. And I believe he's going to come through for so many of you. The next thing is giving makes me more like God. Giving makes me more like God. Is God stingy? No, not at all. He gave us his son, didn't he? He's not stingy in any way. As Joe said earlier, some of you are so stingy, you're squeak when you walk. Man, yeah. In fact, I, I was at Macy's the other day shopping. In case y'all don't know, I love Macy's. And uh, so I went to Macy's and I was shopping and I seen this guy walk up to the perfume counter and he said, hey, ma'am, I want to buy some really nice perfume for my wife. What would you suggest? And so she pulls out this bottle of perfume and hands it to him. And she said, this is a really nice one. And he said, well, how much? And she said, oh, it's $80. And he goes, well, is there one that's not quite so nice? And so she reached back in. She got a, a smaller bottle and handed it to him. And he said, well, how much is this one? She said, well, that one's 50 and he goes, well, I don't know how else to say this, but ma'am, I need to see something a little bit less than that. So she reaches back under and she gets one of those, you know, little test tube things that you can buy. That's like $25. It gives you just enough to know if you really like that perfume. You know what I'm talking about. So she hands that to him and he goes, well, okay, ma'am, let me put it another way. I need to see something really cheap. So she, she handed him a mirror. And, um, yeah. Aren't you glad that God isn't stingy? No, God isn't cheap. He's not stingy. God loves to give to us extravagantly, extravagantly in every way. His love was extravagant when he sent his son. It wasn't just a little love. No, it was extravagant love, and that's the kind of God we serve. All of us know this scripture. You can repeat it with me, right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his only son. He gave the best that he had. And that's the way God wants us to give. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving because love gives. Love gives and it gives the best that you got. That's what Christmas is all about. God loved us so much that he sent us his son. And it blows my mind that Jesus came to this world wrapped in the placenta of a woman, born into this dark, cold earth in a manger, as Joe said earlier, Surrounded by animals and literally his life being threatened from the moment he was born. He was God born. Does that not blow your mind? I mean, you would think God being born would have been born a little bit different, right? In fact, that's why so many people didn't believe that he was the Messiah because they expected him to come in a completely different way because they wanted him to come the way they would have came. And they would have come with men, everybody being held, and hey, this is the baby, this is the Christ child, da 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 da. No, he came completely unexpected form. Why? Because he wanted us to know that he knows exactly how we feel when we're in that dark, dry, thirsty place, when we are born into really bad circumstances. He wants us to know that he knows where we're at. When our life is going through things that are very hard, he wants us to know. He knows how we feel. I remember back in 1987, some of y'all weren't even born, so y'all can't remember this, but it was when CNN first went into 24-hour news. So it was the very, one of the very first times that we got to see a story unfold as it was happening. So literally the world was watching this story. 
and um, some of you will remember, but it was the, the story of baby Jessica. How many of you remember the story of baby Jessica? Baby Jessica was this 18-month-old baby who was playing in her aunt's backyard and fell down this abandoned old well, and it was, the casing was eight inches, and she slipped down into this casing, and we all watched as for 56 hours, these rescuers did everything they possibly could. She fell down 22 feet into this eight-inch casing. Now, can you imagine that? And we're all watching it. And by the time this story is completely unfolding, we're all attached to this baby. I mean, everybody in the world had fell in love with this baby. And everybody wanted to see what happened to this beautiful baby. And after 56 hours, they finally rescue baby Jessica out of this pipe. Love motivated them. Their love motivated them all of these rescue workers for the, for humanity it motivated them to do everything they possibly could to bring her out of that well can i tell you that love was the motivating force that drove christ to come to this earth in the form of a baby and to be born it was love that motivated him to do that for us. That's how much he loved us. And he came knowing we were stuck in this dark, dry, desperate place and in need of a Savior. That's why he came. He came for us. 2,000 years ago on that very first Christmas, he chose to come for us. And it was all because, y'all hear us say it around here all the time, but it's all for the one. It's for the one, the one that doesn't know him, the one that's far from him, the one that he wants to do everything he can possibly do to let them know his love for them. It's for that one. And this next weekend, we have pulled out all stops. I'm telling you, we've been practicing for months. We've done everything. It's going to be the lights. It's going to be the beautiful production that they're going to do on the screens. It's, it's amazing what this team has put together. Our, our whole creative team is amazing. Scott and all of these guys, they have killed it. And then me and Robert's going to be here at this campus. We're going to slay it, ain't we, Robert? We're going to slay it, I'm telling you. And we're going to have a blast. And Jim and all of them over at the Southwest Campus, and you got the Terrace Campus going at the same time. We are all going to put on this production. Why are we doing it? Because we're going after that one, that one that still does not know Jesus, who is desperate, who needs the peace that only he can give. By you giving your life to Jesus, does it guarantee that all your problems are going to go away? <laughs> I wish. No, it doesn't happen like that. But can I tell you? It gives you a peace in your heart that passes all understanding. It gives you a calmness in your soul. And it gives you a power to begin to change your life like nothing else can. Because only the Spirit of God in you can do that. That's what happens. And so this next weekend, I want to challenge you. Who are you going to bring? Who are you going to bring? Because they will come at Christmas time and Easter when they won't come any other time. So dare to invite them to come. And I think some of you are going to be shocked at who shows up and who gets to know Christ for the first time in their life. And the last thing is giving is an investment to eternity. Giving is an investment into eternity. Some of you, by simply inviting somebody next week, you're going to make a difference in their eternity, which, guess what, makes a difference in your eternity. And every single weekend around here, there's this team that helps put on this service. It's not just me and JoJo and, and, and Robert up here singing. Yes, I get to call him JoJo. He's like my son. So that's my nickname for him. Like Jim is Bubby. I get all these nicknames. Yeah, I'm from the South. We have nicknames, okay? I'm Little Bit. I know that's an oxymoron now. But yes, my name is, was Little Bit. But me and JoJo, we ain't the ones that put this on. There is literally hundreds of volunteers every single weekend that help to put this on. And without them, we could not do it. But guess what? It's not just us that see it. God sees it. And he, you are storing up treasures in heaven by doing what you do every single weekend and giving of your time and your energy and your resources and everything else. God sees that, and he's going to bless that. Jesus told us to store up treasure in heaven. How do you do it? I want y'all to read this last scripture with me. Ready, set, go. They should give 
Are y'all ready? One more time. Ready, set, go. They should give happily to those in need, already being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. When you feed the poor, when you give to somebody in need, when you give of your time and you serve somebody, when you bless the widows and the fatherless and you take care of people, all of those things, it's the way to store up treasures in heaven. Because, see, we don't take our money with us. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, have y'all? In fact, I love the story of the woman who her husband on his dying bed made her promise to put all of his money in his casket. So on the day of his funeral, she walked up to his casket and laid a check in it. Some of y'all will get that later today. Yeah, you can't take it with you, can you? The only thing that goes into eternity with us is relationships. It's relationships. It's what we do for one another. This is what goes into eternity. So how much of your life are you truly giving to serve those around you? Because it's the only thing that transcends this world and goes into eternity. Let's pray together.